before we start, I would like to thank our sponsors. Without them, this event wouldn't be possible. And I would also like to thank each and every single one of you. Because as you know, this year, Singularity Tech Day is a charity event. So everything that we collect will be donated to World Central Kitchen. It is an NGO that is devoted to fight against world hunger. And with your uh, help in these hard times, we can really bring food to the people that need it the most. So let's start. My name is Daniela Solis. I'm the AI team lead. I've always been interested in technology. I have a background in software engineering and I did my master in artificial intelligence. Over the past few years, me and my team have been uh, developing solutions in machine learning, computer vision, natural language processing, and mainly using uh, deep learning. I'm very happy to be uh, here today. You have my contact information and please feel free to contact me. I'm always happy for an, uh, to take a nice conversation about AI. So over the past few years, we've seen how AI has grown at an unprecedented speed. Every couple of months, we witness new achievements. And we can say that this is mainly due to three things. The first one is big data. We are currently floated in information, structured and, un un and unstructured data that allows us to gain knowledge, predict, and uh, get valuable insights. And we also see that we have new uh, deep learning model architectures. We are now able to distribute the data and the model is safe in different machines. This helps accelerate the training and it really helps us deal with the exponential growth of the data and the model sizes. And the third thing that makes it also possible is that we have had a lot of improvement in processor speed. Some years ago, when we first started to develop deep learning models, we were able to run them locally in our, in our machines. A bit later, when we started having more data, we needed to use um, graphic processing units to run the models. And now, with the latest advances, we're now able to use uh, TPUs, which um, the ten these tensor processing units have the capability of eight GPUs, approximately. So this allows us to grow into larger and larger models and use uh, big data to train them. This led to the release of the GP3 algorithm in May of 2020. And this model has really sounded a lot in the media. All people are really um, uh, talking about it and all the applications that you can uh, do with it. And just to give us an idea, the size of this uh, model is 175 billion neurons, which is the double of the human brain. The human brain has approximately 85 billion neurons. And before the release of this GPT-3, uh, the previous largest model was Turing NLG. And this model was, uh, had like 17.5 uh, billion neurons. So as you can see, uh, the, the, all the improvements that we've been doing lately in AI are really being done by scale solutions. So larger data sets, larger models, and have supercomputers to be able to cope with uh, this amount of data processing and, and the, the model architectures. And these models has really helped raise awareness of the power of AI and has opened a bit of, like, um, has shown a bit of what we can really do uh, uh, on all the possibilities that are going to come in the, uh, in the near future with these uh, models and their capabilities. However, it has also raised some concerns because lately, uh, AI industry is leaving a lot of uh, carbon footprint. In, nine, in 2019, there was a study led by Emma Sturbel where, where they uh, analyzed a lot of uh, the uh, models and how much it, uh, energy it took them to train. And the previous uh, GP GPT model, the GPT-2 model, they estimated that the, uh, the amount of energy to, that took to train it is around the total lifetime of five cars. So that is a lot. And we have to think of that the GPT-2 is 100 times smaller than the GPT-3. So some estimates about the GPT-3 say that it costs around $10 million to train and the energy that it took is around 0.5 to 3 gigawatt hours 
Um, just to give us an idea, one gigawatt hour, it's the equivalent of what a nuclear uh, power plant um, output in an hour. So these numbers have really raised concern in, uh, in the field. And um, we're like the community is really working toward more efficient um, computing and taking into account the amount that the models, uh, like the memory of, um, of resources that you need and the amount of energy that you need to train and to run the models. So TinyML, it's an emergent discipline that is focusing on this factor. It's trying to build uh, solutions that are efficient and that take into account the amount of memory that they use and the computation resources that they use. So we can say that TinyML it's the intersection between machine learning uh, embedded in uh, IoT devices. So if we think about what uh, traditional IoT, uh, uh, the idea of it was that uh, we had devices that were continuously monitoring and generating data, and that data was sent to the cloud to be processed and to get some insights. And of course, the traditional idea of IoT led to a lot of challenges, such as the ones that we see, latency, connectivity, storage, privacy. And what Tiny Machine Learning uh, is trying to do is trying to solve these challenges and to bring uh, machine learning solutions. So let's, let's take a look a bit more into detail about all these challenges. So for example, connectivity. If we think about IoT devices, they can be in really remote places. So think for a second of the idea of having our IoT devices in a farm, in a remote farm, and we're trying to monitor the current status of the food that we're growing. If we need to wait for our device to have connectivity to get insights, this solution would not be possible because a lot of places where we're growing food are lacking of, of connectivity and perhaps they only have connectivity once every uh, couple of days so it is not possible to be only dependent on the Wi-Fi that they might get. Another important thing is storage. Thanks to IoT devices we are really gathering a lot of data and that data is really helping us to, to train deep learning models. But once we have a solution that is working we not every time want to uh, store all the data that is uh, processed uh, and that is uh, um, gathered every couple of seconds because that would mean that we would have to store it all and it will be a lot of, um, of storage. So for example, let's think of uh, the idea of a security camera. We're we are, uh, running a surveillance um, uh, software and if you think about it, the camera will be running up 24 hours a day and most of the footage would not be useful. So if you're able to process the, the information directly on the camera and only select the times where it's really needed when something is happening, and we only send those and we save those in the cloud, then the amount of storage that we need could be really reduced. And also we would have to, to transmit less information to the cloud. Another important factor is privacy. When we're uh, developing uh, software in a cloud environment, everything is, let's say, encapsulated. So everything is way more secure. Here, when we're looking about uh, Internet of Things, uh, we're transmitting continuously data to the cloud. So, of course, it opens the door to possible privacy violations. Mm, let's, like, any, at any time when we're transmitting the data, it can be intercepted by a malicious actor and it is way less secure than, for example, as I was mentioning, in a cloud where everything is uh, in a data warehouse. But, for example, if we process all the information in the device and we only send the insights or the inference of what we're trying to uh, process, then the amount of times that we have to communicate with the, with the cloud is way less. So we keep the information in the device, making it more secure and uh, making it a bit more private. Another important thing is real-time decisions. So if we think about it, some of the solutions where we are going to use machine learning 
really are dependent on real-time inference. Uh, for example, we're trying to monitor the traffic or we having, we're trying to trigger an alarm when something uh, serious happens. If, we would, if the model takes a lot of time to do the inference, then of course uh, the solution is not feasible. If we also have to send the, 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 the data to the cloud to wait till this process and then come back, it is, uh, it is not good enough. So then we really need to work towards a more efficient model that can really make the inference fast and deliver real-time decisions. And as I was mentioning, one of the most uh, important factors for time EML is trying to make it more energy efficient so that it has less impact in the environment. If we think about it, every time we're transmitting uh, data from, uh, through Wi-Fi, it is costing a lot of energy. So we really need to find a way to uh, perform less data transfers to make it more efficient. And of course, having lightweight models that make it more efficient. And finally, looking at the, the latency, for example, a lot of IoT, normal IoT solutions would, would have the model in the cloud. So let's think about it for a second uh, about devices that are based on our uh, speak recognition. If, for example, I was, I'm wondering where, what's the, the, the weather today or if I want to switch songs or whatever, and if I have to wait to send the data all the way to the cloud and then go back, the amount of time that it, uh, is lost is not that efficient. If we think about it, it's a bit like a carrier pigeon, a modern car carrier pigeon. So, and we're also making sort of like dumb devices because the device really is not thinking. We have to wait till the model is process, like the model uh, inference is done in the cloud. And we are dependent on how the speed of the internet, if we even have internet, thinking about the places where are really remote. So yeah, like we're not even able to handle the inference time because we also depend on other factors such as the uh, the internet in our solution. So all these issues have led to edge computing. And the idea of edge computing is bringing this intelligence into the edge. And by edge, we mean the, mom the, the, the place where the device is connected to the internet. So the actual device, the microcontroller. And of course, this brings new challenges because as we all know, Microcontrollers have computation, memory, and power constraints. So this leads us to really have to do uh, efficient uh, algorithms. And improving the efficiency of our models is not only for, for small devices. It can also be done, and it should be done also thinking in larger models. Um, a really nice example, for example, is the uh, Bonsai from Microsoft. This algorithm, it's a... Uh, two kilobyte uh, size algorithm. And it performs the same or even better than other models that are 10,000 uh, times bigger than this. So it is really impressive and it is possible. And even sometimes it's even possible without compromising the accuracy of the model. So uh, what it, we're really in an interesting point uh, in, uh, in machine learning we see that the field is sort of bifurcating between two paradigms. The first one is the one that we saw in the introduction, where we're having really larger and larger models processing big data, and of course we need to process it in supercomputers. So we're processing and analyzing all this information in data centers and are really achieving amazing results because of the size of the model. This is one uh, paradigm. But the other one is the one that we've been talking uh, right now, that it's a paradigm that is more data-centric. The idea is to process information locally. And of course, by meaning locally, we meaning in small devices. And therefore you have to have a more efficient and better algorithm to work with. And this data-centric uh, paradigm is just beginning, but it's really gonna grow a lot. If we think about it, right now we have a lot of IoT devices and most of these IoT devices have embedded in them machine learning models. And this trend is only continuing and it's growing more and more uh, as, the days, uh, as the years pass by. 
we sometimes see uh, smart devices in places where we before we didn't even think they were and we don't even know this them there anymore so for example we see smart doorbells smart uh, thermostats and even our smartphones with these wakes uh, of uh, words and as i'm mentioning like this is just a beginning so more and more we're gonna see uh, smart devices everywhere in, in every aspect of our lives and of course all of these devices means that you have to deploy neural networks in in small constraint uh, resources so we have low memory we have uh, limited power to train and to run the models and we have uh, uh, limited computational resources so these are big challenges and there's still a lot of room for improvement but in, over the past few years we've made a lot of uh, advances in it and we're really uh, we're really working not only in the software and developing efficient models but also in the hardware side uh, side so for example our very uh, easy example of this is the wakeboards we all have a smartphone and by just saying hey google or hey, hey siri we can uh, activate our devices and if we think about it running that algor uh, algorithm in our phone in our cpu that is continuously listening to everything that we say until someone says those words, it would drain our, our battery in a couple of hours. But now, because of the improvements also in the hardware side, uh, we're developing low uh, power devices, that, for example, a battery that is in the size of a coin that can run even for a year and that can even run when the CPU is not functioning. So for example, if your phone is not like the screen of your phone is not turned on you can still uh, it's still uh, running and it's still um, uh, checking what are you saying and uh, this type of technology is really allowing us to bring uh, the intelligence of uh, machine learning models in remote uh, areas and only being able to communicate when you need it to save the power and to uh, last with uh, a small battery for longer time. So we can think of tiny ML as a small, but I would say mighty, because although it's so only starting, uh, it's a relatively new paradigm, uh, it's already producing uh, surprising results for inference and in, uh, for models uh, deployed in, in microcontrollers. Um, some of the examples that we have is, for example, anomaly detection and predictive maintenance. Uh, we're all used to the giving maintenance, for example, to our cars, and we do it every certain period of time. But if you think about it, it is not very optimal. Because our car is not going to break every couple of years or a couple of months. It will break all of a sudden, depending on the status of the machine. And this happens in all machinery. So if we're able to monitor closely all the parameters of the machine, we can really uh, determine when uh, there's an anomaly, when the machine is not working properly, and when it needs to be fixed. And not only that, we can really train our model to let us know in, with enough time so that we can uh, schedule a maintenance without affecting any of our production, and let's say if we're in a factory or any of our like flight schedules, if it's uh, an airplane, and so on and so forth. Like another nice example is Face ID. We all have it in our phones. We also have speech recognition, so we have these wakeboards that we were talking about, or for example, we can even uh, recognize the emotions. And we also have a very uh, big, like, well, not big, but uh, uh, very strong, uh, powerful, uh, uh, computer vision deep uh, learning models that can have object detection, image segmentation, um, for example, for surveillance cameras and so on. So like this, so this type of uh, use cases are already possible. Another interesting case is, for example, smart farming, where we're able to gather all the sensors, all the information of the health of the plants that we're growing, and we can really make precision agriculture. That is going to it's a subject that is going to be uh, more and more important, uh, especially in the future, where we really need to make it the most efficient way to uh, get food for the world. So although these are some of the possibilities of uh, tiny ML that are already possible, 
and if you think about it, it's just the beginning. So how does a uh, tiny amount really works? What is it like uh, that it's, uh, um, how, the, how, the, how the, does it work? If you think about it, tiny amount is like traditional uh, machine learning. We train our model in the same way. We use a user computer or the cloud. And when it really, when it really starts, it's afterwards, it's after training. And we can often refer to this uh, process also like deep compression. So let's take a uh, dive deep into some of the techniques that we use for tiny amount. So as I was mentioning, we have to start after training. So we have already a model that is working and it's performing quite good. And now our, our interest is to create a compact representation of that model. Um, there are a few techniques that we could use. And the first one that I want to introduce to you is the model distillation or also, uh, also known as the knowledge installation. So the idea uh, underlying uh, this technique is that, for example, when you're training large uh, neural networks, they tend to be very sparse and they, you tend to have some redundancy inside the network. So the idea is that if we, uh, we have these large uh, networks that are, uh, have a high uh, representational capacity, we can also from it get um, a, a network that is as, uh, saturated and that is smaller and it has a, 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 small, a lower uh, representation capacity. So what we do is we have the original model that we could uh, treat as a, as a teacher model. And what we want to do is we transfer the embedded information in that model into our new model, that is the, the student or, or uh, the distilled uh, model. So we train them by uh, teaching and transferring this knowledge into a smaller network that has less parameters. And that the idea of it is that it's less redundant, but it still has all the information needed to perform well. Of course, all these uh, techniques will have a, an effect in accuracy. But the idea is to reduce it and, and try to find ways to combat it, to uh, achieve uh, better results or similar results, but with having all the advantage of, uh, of these techniques that we've already seen such as like uh, efficiency and, and, and um, the possibility to have these uh, models in everywhere, like in really small devices. Another possibility is model pruning. So basically what you do here is you also try to have a more compact representation of your model. And the underlying idea is that, uh, as you all know, neural networks are, are, are um, are there, the inside they have uh, uh, weights and all these weights are combined to get this output. So we normally know that if a weight has a higher value, it will have more impact in the output of the network. So what we try to do here is to remove the neurons that are, little, are for little utility or that don't impact that much in the output of the network. So we remove those, uh, net, those neurons and then we uh, retrain the pruned uh, neural network to make sure that the accuracy of the model is still good enough. Another technique that we need to take into account when we're uh, the developing tiny, uh, tiny ML solutions is quantization. So after training, we need to make our network like we need to develop a network in a way that it's, the format is compatible with the device that it's going to run in. And um, most Miku controllers use 8-bit uh, arithmetic. And for example, the traditional computers that we use are based on 32 or 64 uh, floating point uh, representations. So what we do when we quant uh, quantize a model is that uh, the, the storage size of the weights is reduced by a factor of, uh, of four. And of course, this is, impacts the accuracy of the model. Uh, it impacts the accuracy around one to three percent. And of course, this means that some information will be lost. And this is known as the quantization error. 
So the idea of it, of why, why do we lose this information or why it's uh, like an error is because let's imagine that we have a weight with a value of 8.42. If we truncate, truncate that value into 8, in a, a floating 8 uh, representation, then of course we're losing uh, some of it. So a way that we can combat that is by uh, having a quantization of our word training. So basically what we do is like, uh, remember how I was saying that most of time EMO goes after the training. Well, this uh, technique, what it has, what it does is it's focused also in the moment where you're uh, initially training the neural network and you only use values that are available wh when you're going to quantize. So by then by the time that you adapt the format for the microcontroller um, uh, device, you already have values that will um, that uh, that will work, and you don't impact the accuracy because the entire training you monitor the the training and you make sure that the the accuracy was good enough. So after that, we can encode our model, and the idea of it is to reduce the model size by storing the data in the most most efficient way possible. So we encode it and then what we what we need to do is we need to um, make it in a format that it can be uh, uh, run in a lightweight uh, interpreter. So the most um, common one, the most popular one is TF Lite. And what we do is we then, the model is compiled into a C or a C++ uh, code. And why C or C++? Well, because it's the language that most uh, microcontrollers uh, use and they work in it because it's uh, most me the most uh, memory efficient way. So we, we, we run it in this uh, software and of course, we need to, because it's so small and it's trying to be efficient, we also lose a bit of the capabilities that we, for example, would have if we were working with TensorFlow. Normal, the one normal one. So for example, we are not able to debug the model or to visualize what's going on because that functionality had to be removed uh, because of the complexity of the microcontrollers. And what we also need to uh, take into account is that when we're trying to deploy these models in a microcontroller, it's not only about the size of the model, because what we need to think is that in a microcontroller, they have to have the operating system, they have to have the model saved in it, but they also have to have in the enough cap uh, capacity to run the model for the inference of it. So of course, all this is really important when you are uh, taking into account the development of these models, and that's the, like, that's the amount of uh, like uh, it's, it's that hard and it's that uh, important that you really make efficient models because it's not only saving it but also running in it and the last thing that we can also do to make it more efficient and to uh, work better is to w tailor our models into an efficient architecture so uh, what do we do what we, what does it mean it means that when we're defining the architecture of our network we can take some decisions into how to build it in order that in order that it works better. So, for example, a very nice uh, uh, example of this is the mobile net. This mobile net uh, was uh, running in mobile devices. So, when they needed to do convolution operations inside it, instead of doing it in a traditional way, they introduced a deep separable convolution. And basically what it is, it's still convolution, but what it does, it is splits the kernel to process it in a more efficient way. And this is only one of the possibilities, but as we develop this software, it's still a process that it can be taken into account as in any other uh, uh, software solution. Like when we're when we are developing no more software, we also take into account certain patterns for certain uh, uh, software uh, good practices so to have efficient code. This should also be done when you're talking about uh, architectures. We need to start thinking about how the architectures work inside. 
and not think about them as only uh, black boxes that we know that work and then we just fine tune a bit of the models and don't uh, understand what is going on underneath. It's really nice that we already have all these uh, models that are working that we can use, but it's very uh, good when we think about it and when we uh, understand what is going uh, underneath it and we can really optimize it and work in a way that is more efficient or, or that it works better for a prog project or what we're trying to do. So we've seen that we have the ability to run machine learning models in research constraint devices. And this opens the door to infinite possibilities. We are able to develop models that are uh, energy efficient. And of course, this means that they will impact less our environment. Uh, we've also seen that TinyML allows us to have use cases that normal scale models would not be able to uh, achieve. So for example, having uh, small devices that work in remote environments where there's barely connectivity, um, um, we're really able to make uh, smart decisions regardless of the, um, the place we're in, if there's enough internet, etc. And this, of course, opens the possibility to use cases such as like predictive maintenance that we were talking about in an airplane or, for example, uh, analyzing animals in the jungle, etc. And this, is, this doesn't mean that in the field of AI, we won't have uh, scientists still working to grow the size of our model and to achieve and really push the boundaries of AI and show us all the new things that we are going to be able to do as uh, AI progresses. That is also something that is uh, nice and that I really, as I was mentioning, like creates awareness of the possibilities of AI. And scientists will still work on that. But there is a new trend that is coming out that is working with memory and compute and energy efficient. And it's only starting. It's only the beginning, so we're just seeing what we're going to be able to do with this and I'm really looking forward to see what will happen in the next couple of years. So thank you very much and I hope to see you soon.